have, we're just going to do it on one, one scanner. scanner. For me, 1.5T any day of the week. Now, at the end of the day, if something is wrong on that report, are you answer for it? Or is it the manufacturer of the AI system? Some of the stuff you could still get from Echo, but it's the tissue characterization on MRI that's completely revolutionized what we do. Basically, it showed off that there has been like a five-fold increase in terms of cardiac MRI scans per four mm -hmm. in 10 years. I would say that the biggest learning curve for radiographers with this is the ECG. And in the end, stress perfusion is better at 3T. No question about that. Do you think that COVID-19 might have an impact in increasing even more this numbers of card this need for cardiac MRI scans. And his heart, rather than being pointing up over here, was actually on the right Whoa. side of the chest. There's an unclear yeah. correlation between <laughs> yeah, yeah. COVID-19 and, and myocarditis, and that comes about from, uh, I believe, a controversial paper that was released. I know a few scanners already can detect if the patient is in distress or not. So I think we're going quite fast in that direction. <laughs>
kind of a little bit fledgling at that stage. It was quite difficult to get scans. There were very few centers that did it. And some of the stuff you could still get from ECHO, but it's the tissue characterization on MRI that's completely revolutionized what we do for many reasons, but predominantly in the earlier stages was about making a diagnosis. So finding things that you just didn't know were there before. And so when you start your new service, what you find is everybody thinks, oh, this probably won't change much because we've got echo. And then, of course, very quickly, all your colleagues buy in because they start seeing actually echo is fine for the majority of things in cardiology. But there's a load of niche stuff where we were missing stuff before that we now can see what it actually was. And of course, that then completely changed. Mm. What is you is might that do why you actually also went into research as well? Probably. So why did I go into research? Most car so the first thing to say about that is in this country, most cardiology registrars do do research. About yeah. 70% of us do it. So that journey is almost preordained for you. Okay. Um, I wanted to do it. I'd actually been involved with research before. So before I started doing MRI, I'd done some research in resuscitation. So I'm actually quite a... Uh, I saw you have around 80 papers, maybe, yeah, so just on cardiac MRI. I don't know if it's, it's some, some, so before that I had did quite a lot of stuff in the resuscitation field about using defibrillators. Yes. And so I've always been interested in research and it's just, it's very different to clinical because clinical is thinking about the patient in front of you. Research is thinking about actually in 10 years time, what should we do to this patient? What are we going to be able Absolutely. to do? What new sequences are we going to have? What new cool technology are we going to have? And yeah. can you be at the forefront of trying to, you know, predict the future of kind of yeah absolutely can i ask you something mm. Dan? because mm. i already have a curiosity from yeah. your introduction yeah. you said something now that i have stuck here in my mind i want to ask you something so you said that you started building out let's say the service and you had a couple of patients two three yeah now you're getting like something like 40 50 yes so um about this in literature there is a study i think conducted by the british society of cmr yeah. i think it was from 2008 and 2018 yeah. which showed out, which basically showed off that there has been like a five-fold increase in terms of cardiac MRI scans per four mm -hmm. in 10 years. Yeah. Do you think for this trend, there is a specific reason in your opinion, something that can justify or just this increasing need for uh, cardiac MRI scans? Many reasons. Many reasons. So the first thing is, so why is it that in effect, putting me at King suddenly created all this extra work? Because the patients didn't change. You're not suddenly got a load of people in 2016 at King's that didn't exist in 2013 uh, sort of thing. So the first thing is you need drivers to do it. You need individuals who are going to try and explain to others. So senior colleagues of mine, when they train, MRI didn't exist as a thing for cardiac. Yep. So they don't they didn't know what we do. What's the point of this? And that sort of information might come their way through conferences. But when you stick somebody on site that they're directly interacting with, that makes an enormous difference. It's kind uh, of a peer pressure there. Yeah, partly. But I think, I, I suppose if you want to put it another way, one of the challenges I see in cardiac CT is where some services have failed is if you have a radiologist who doesn't come to your cardiology MDT meetings, there become problems because if you can't put a face to a name on a report and you haven't got somebody saying, actually, this is what's good with CT, this is the cool things we can do, this is where we want referrals you start running into problems with this. And I mean, it's no different to, you know, those radiologists when they're reporting a CT chest for lung cancer will go to the lung cancer MDT yeah. to show yeah. the oncologist, Absolutely. here's the cancer. This, you know, this is where it is, or the surgeon, here's where it is. You know, this is what it looks like. Here's what's around it. It's the same sort of concept. So you've got to be interactive with colleagues. The technique, of course, research has massively increased in the field. It's well-funded for research in this country. So the British Heart Foundation, who's a big charity funder of what we do, are partly responsible for that. They've put a lot of investment in. So mm -hmm. you've just got a lot of people who are interested and they've driven this. And then the data then comes with it. And then, of course, you start finding things that people didn't see before. And, of course, there then becomes, what else am I missing? <laughs> so, of course, you just, it becomes just a snowball yes. of increase in referrals. So. And I might have also like a follow up question about that. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation. It was mm. great. And I completely agree with all the reasons. And but I think there is an interesting thing about the future as well. Yeah. I noticed like mm. uh, on my notes over that you're mm. also like a cardiology colleague for uh, COVID-19 yeah. services in London. Right. Yes. Do you think, still referring to this kind of survey about the fact that there is a massive increase in cardiac, for all the reasons that you said for cardiac MRI examination, do you think that COVID-19 might have 
an impact in increasing even more this numbers of card this need for cardiac MRI scans? So you've got to look at what can cardiac MR do that other things struggle with. And so with the COVID side of things, particularly early on, there was the debate around myocarditis, so inflammation of heart muscle. You can't see that on echo. So ultrasound is not good for this. If you have wall motion abnormality, so if there's enough inflammation that the heart doesn't contract very well, you'll see that on echo. Beyond that, if the heart contraction is normal, it will just look like a normal echo scan. So MRI comes into its own for imaging inflammation. And so, of course, for myocarditis, which, of course, can be associated with COVID and a whole number of other things. But, of course, it got a huge amount of airtime through the COVID pandemic because yeah. so many people got COVID. I suspect exactly. everybody in this room has had yeah. COVID, right? <laughs> yeah, right. probably even right. over the last Maybe now. Right. <laughs> you know. Probably even right, now. Right, right, right. So, 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 you know, I mean, it, it's a, it was yeah. a suddenly you chucked in this new disease. And I think some of it also, one of the things we talked about a lot in our department was one of the things that COVID did to academics, because we were really interested because new disease and we actually knew what it was going to do yeah. in 2020. So things that were less of interest to us as clinicians suddenly became more. So I give the example that we do a blood test called troponin, which is a marker for heart mm -hmm. muscle damage on intensive care units often might be slightly elevated for a whole number of reasons when someone's very sick. And we wouldn't be that interested in that. It's just a marker that you're very sick in effect. But suddenly, of course, if the patient's got COVID, well, maybe that might be interesting. Mm. Why have they got this? And so suddenly you've put this patient through an MRI scan, whereas the patient in the room next to them who had some other illness that might have done the same thing had never been that interesting before. So I think it changed mindsets a little bit. Yeah. But because MRI is so good at imaging inflammation in the heart muscle, that's why, yeah, I definitely added a bit to it without question. I mean, it added to our workload. Without question, it did. Talking about the, the COVID situation, mm. I was watching one of your lectures that you mm. gave a while ago. Mm. I think it was 2020. Yeah. 2021, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And you mentioned actually about this myocarditis and mm. COVID mm. that you believe, and let me just quote clearly, there's, <laughs> there's an unclear yeah. correlation between <laughs> yeah, yeah. COVID-19 and, and myocarditis. And that comes about from, uh, I believe, a controversial paper that was released. Um, can you just go through that statement? And So the challenge with this becomes, if you go back maybe five, 10 years, or pre-COVID, yes, so, you know, go back sort of five years, the majority of people we were di diagnosing with myocarditis were people who came into hospital, we usually with chest pain mimicking a heart attack yep. because heart muscle inflammation is what you get in the heart attacks. They often present in a similar way, have very high troponin levels and then go through an MRI scan and you find some quite impressive changes. That's what myocarditis for the majority of patients in effect used to be. The problem we had with COVID was you had plenty of that. I mean, you know, that happened. But there was then this group of patients who, in effect, particularly in the more sort of long COVID cohort or patients who'd had COVID and were quite well and hadn't had symptoms, that suddenly people started looking at, the, in effect, a group of patients that we wouldn't normally study. And the question then is how subtle, looking at subtlety is more difficult. Looking at gross change is very easy. But as with, as with all imaging techniques, the more subtle the problem, the more difficult it then becomes. And then you start getting the debate around one person might think this is abnormal, another person might not. There are issues with mapping techniques in younger females, particularly because the myocardium is thinner, which means the spatial resolution becomes more difficult. It becomes easier to overcall, in my view. Mm, okay. but, but the reality becomes that might be wrong. The gold standard for diagnosis of myocarditis is a biopsy. So, you know, at okay. the end of the day, if you yeah. really want to know, you've got to do a biopsy with this. In this country, we almost never biopsy for it, probably because you're both sitting there thinking, well, biopsy of the heart doesn't sound... Yeah, you know, it, doesn't sound <laughs> yeah it, it sounds, sounds very so, vague. But, right. Yeah. right. So, so, I actually wanted to touch the, my the, heart. Right. So, you know, if I said you have an MRI <laughs> scan of your heart tomorrow, you'd be yeah. thinking, as long as you're not claustrophobic, you'd be thinking, well, whatever, I don't care. I'll, I'll sleep well tonight, not worried about it. If I said you're going to biopsy your heart tomorrow, you'd be thinking, <laughs> actually, the risk is small. But we share that view. So it's rare to actually do the gold standard with this. Of course, you're then left with, well, is MRI sort of the gold standard? And It's a grey yeah, area then. And, and yeah. so in effect, in, I, I believe the reason why you saw a lot of conflicting data around yep. this is where it's more subtle 
it becomes more difficult, becomes more of a grey zone. What is very likely, and certainly my experience of this now, seeing in effect what's happened to a lot of these patients down the line, is these more subtle cases are very unlikely to be problematic. Because of course, at the time, you're thinking, well, actually, is this going to be a problem for this patient in a year's time? Are they going to run into problems like heart failure or whatever? That isn't what I've seen with this through my services. Those that have had things that are very borderline generally have been fine. Yep. So in effect, that becomes almost becomes, well, if you found it, does it matter? Mm -hmm. The problem can become if you label what do you then do with treatment? You know, do you start giving aggressive treatment that might switch off the immune system? That's not without yep. risk. So, you know, for some patients... It's difficult with this. And we, we try and the ones that are subtle, we try and discuss as a group because, yeah. you know, I think sometimes that's what in effect yeah, for me absolutely. is what MDT is for, mm -hmm. you know, see what other people think about this. And you will often hear debate amongst all of us around, you know, but whereas the old style patient, if you like, or you know, the, the patient who came in with, you know, bad chest pain, large troponin rise, you wouldn't need normally need to put that through an MDT. It's usually blindingly obvious on MRI what the problem is. Absolutely. The more subtle one where the troponin's normal or very marginal. That's where the question arises. Much yeah. more difficult case. I asked yeah. you this because mm. uh, it's quite often to see athletes nowadays having yeah. more <clears throat> cardiac arrests or more cardiac problems. And even today, a 15-year-old player in Spain just died is that right? of a is that heart right? attack, yeah. sudden heart gosh, attack while terrible. they were yeah. practicing. Yeah. So that's why I asked you because a lot of people mentioned this is a COVID COVID, uh, problem, long COVID or the vaccines or something like that. And I wanted to know if there's a way to demystify this or if you actually believe it's something like that or yeah, if you have another um, opinion. Sudden so cardiac arrest in athletes is not a new thing. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not a new thing. And different countries have different views about what they do with this. So the most common cause of that happening in somebody who is very young is a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is mm -hmm. a genetic yeah. problem. Now, if you're at home in Italy, you're not allowed to do competitive sport without screening for that problem. Yeah, we're so always ECG, very conservative. Right, yeah. ECG, <laughs> like with pizza and pasta, we have been saying. But let's not talk about this. <laughs> You're going to digress, but what I would say, if I lived in Italy, um, I would probably be about 20 stone heavier. Yeah. Than I think all the food is. is all oh, I think man. we need to clarify what 20 Ro stone is. Ro 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 Rome is like my favorite city, but uh, um, yeah, goodness, Italian food, best food. Um, so the most common cause is a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a genetic problem where the heart muscle is too thick. About one in 500 people have it, which is why the view in Italy is to screen for it. There's a load of debate. That's a whole nother session about whether screening is the right thing to do uh, for this problem. Most people will not run an aggressive course with that, even if they've got it. That's not the most common outcome to have a cardiac arrest as a result of it. But the screening is done for that. But there are lots of other reasons why it can happen. Other inherited heart problems, problems with the electrics in the heart. Myocarditis, yes, is associated with sudden death problems with coronary artery disease. In young people, that's uncommon to have. So whether well, this was to say to you, be careful with cardiac arrest and heart attack are not interchangeable. Yep. Heart mm. attack, block coronary vessel. Yep. Cardiac arrest, heart stops. Many reasons why cardiac arrest might happen. Heart attack, blocked vessel. And that can happen in young people. This is really important, yeah. So we saw, for example, with COVID, COVID made it a bit more likely to have for younger, more so females have something called coronary dissection. So... As you might see in the aortic dissection, yeah. the coronary is a little bit more likely to dissect. The AstraZeneca vaccine uh, in a small number of people made blood clots more common. Yeah, that was you quite, remember. quite around the news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had one patient who unfortunately had a heart attack very shortly. A young patient had a heart attack very shortly after AstraZeneca vaccine almost certainly was related, was very unlucky. So, yeah. you know, all of these things... My own personal view with this is <clears throat> I don't think those things are why you're seeing what you're seeing. I just think you're seeing more press around things that were happening anyway. People are showing more interest. We have more in access to, to information. Yeah, completely. Maybe. I mean, you know, I remember going actually to a Tottenham, we talked about Chelsea earlier. I remember going <laughs> to a Tottenham Chelsea game. It would have been probably 10 years ago. And not long before that game, a Serie B player in Italy had had a cardiac arrest. There you go. And the reason why I remember it is because one of the sat the tragedies of it is that nobody did chest compressions on it. Mm. So I spent yeah. a lot of time trying to teach yeah. CPR, and there's been a lot and a lot learned, I think, in Italy about that case. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think it's changing CPR now. Yeah, I think it's, it's changing. the only good thing about that incident. It's yeah, yeah. there were awareness of yeah. it. Yeah. Without the incidents, nothing you know, will change. Yeah. To be honest, I agree. So, unfortunately. So 
you know, these things still happened before, yeah. unfortunately. I mean, we, we have a very prominent charity in this country called Cardiac Risk in the Young, who offers screening to young people who want to have it. Oh. If you become a professional athlete, quite often you'll get screened in this country. For example, so, in, in Portugal, I used to play basketball. Yeah. And the screening we had was literally an ECG. Yeah. And maybe a treadmill for half an hour where they would do the tracing yeah. and that was it. Nothing else. The biggest yield... So if you look at what CRY do, CRY at risk in the young, the majority of the screenings they do will just be an ECG. And then if the ECG is normal... And there's, no, there's nothing else exciting. I mean, obviously, if the patient comes in and says, oh, I've got family history of sudden death in somebody who you do more with that, even whatever on the ECG. The majority of patients, so if there's nothing in the family history, they're otherwise well, and the ECG is normal, that's all you do. Some people screen with ECG and ultrasound and echo. But that, that's UK or you mean general? It depends. So in the UK, for example, you know, if you were going to sign for Chelsea Football Club tomorrow, I would be stunned if you got your name on the bottom of the contract without mm. an echo. Mm. Yeah. Because, <laughs> for, for example, so, in Portugal, for me, I was doing yeah. that and yeah. I have a heart mu murmur. Yeah. So since I was, an echo. yeah. yeah. And yeah. then I have history of cardiac failure mm. and all of those situations. And they never did any MRI. They never did any yeah, kind of other I mean, tests for me for, to play. And I was playing, uh, I was practicing every day twice and then playing on the weekends and most, had panic attacks. I thought it was cardiac arrest or I was having something like that. I mean, most people have got a murmur. If they go for screening, you'd end up doing an echo. The yeah. majority of murmurs are benign. Yeah, mine the majority was, of benign, was diagnosed as benign. In, in yeah. the end, the majority, the vast majority are benign, but most people end up with an echo. Once you've gone down the screening route, if you find something, most people end up with an echo. Mm, okay. MRI, not normally used in screening yeah. for yeah. this sort of thing. That's where I was you, aiming so at. So I was yeah. going to say, so that MRI generally comes in when there's debate around an abnormal ECG. Yeah. Or an abnormal echo. So when there's suspicion of pathology already, yeah. that's when we go to, to the yeah. MRI. Talking about cardiac MRI, though, yeah. specifically, because mm -hmm. I think we have a good portion of our audience which are radiographers, cardiac yeah. MRI radiographers, yeah. cardiologists, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So going a little bit more in detail of the scan itself, yeah. I think people over there, they would like to know from a national award-winning consultant, <laughs> don't lie about this, I know, I didn't want to say but I have to say. Yeah. What, is, what might be your suggestion about, let's start from a very basic, what would be like a good way for patient preparation for a cardiac MRI scan? Do you have any tips and tricks about patient preparation, anything you would recommend to a radiographer or even like to the fellow, to whoever does a screening, whatever? So the first thing, as always with this, is before the patient even gets to you, there's yeah. sometimes stuff you need to do with this. So broadly speaking in cardiac MR, there's I suppose you could almost sort of say three types of scan. There's a sort of a basic where the majority of patients will have some cine imaging done. So we'll have a look at the heart moving and give them some contrast, give them some gadolinium. We have some patients that are congenital patients. That's a whole, again, it's a whole nother topic. A whole that. topic, yeah. <laughs> and then the other group is stress MRI. Yeah. And now that group of patients, if you don't do the bit before they get to the get to you right, the whole thing falls in a heap. So they're going to get a drug called adenosine. Adenosine is a drug which is a vasodilator. So in effect, the way the drug works, is it makes the coronary arteries get bigger if they're normal. You then put contrast in and see um, whether it all goes in, uh, in, in effect at the same speed down the coronary arteries. If there's a blockage, that blockage will mean the contrast will go slower down that vessel. If you have caffeine in the lead up to the test, Caffeine stops adenosine from working. This is a complete disaster. Now, I can tell you at King's, there is no route to get to MRI that doesn't take you past a Costa. <laughs> right? Just where you need it. Costa well, coffee, of course. They, they have, they, they're not stupid at Costa. They've positioned themselves beautifully so yeah. that every entrance to the hospital, you've got to walk past one, oh, right? <laughs> Which is great yeah. for them and actually great for me when I go to work in the morning. <laughs> but actually, if you want to do a stress MRI, it's a complete freaking disaster. Okay. But here comes so, the question. You know. Would you accept like a patient that probably have like a coffee or something like that? Because I know yeah. it can be quite uh, unbalanced. Yeah, yeah. Decision. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, this is difficult. It depends when they had yeah. it. So some of the challenge with this is some people. Are, so even if they've done what you've told them, some people are actually slow metabolizers of caffeine, which actually makes the stress difficult so one of the big things for us actually when we do the study is looking at have we adequately stressed the heart or not because sometimes if, if you haven't adequately stressed the heart and it looks normal yeah. that's actually that's not useful 
uh, information in effect that becomes potentially a false negative uh, test. Um, so from my point of view, the key thing is the pay, you know, whatever you send to the patient, have you communicate with them, you need to tell them that the biggest problem we've got the NHS at the moment is waiting times. So what inevitably is happening is the patient gets the letter today saying, come to King's for your stress MRI scan. And we've written in big bold on the letter, don't have caffeine. Now, of course, if there's now a six month delay, in six months' time, you think the patient's yeah, going to remember that? The only thing they will remember exactly. is the date. Right. That's it. Because they put it in their phone, yeah. you know, sort of thing. So it becomes key that somebody is on the case in your admin team to say to the patient. Now, of course, in the private sector where the scan, you know, you might be booking the scan a week later, you're probably going to be fine. Even then, we still have problems. Yeah, even then, we call the patients the day before yeah, or say, at least two days before just to confirm even, for example, a small bowel. We also confirm exactly. they're coming one hour before. Because yeah. the problem you've then got is if the patient turns up having just had a coffee, what do you then do? Which is uh, coming on to the question you asked. It is difficult. I don't generally scan people within six hours of having had a coffee unless there's an extremely good Reason. reason for it. You can sometimes get around to give higher doses. It, it depends on a whole number of things. There are some patients where you're a bit worried about giving a higher dose. It's looking, for me, some of it is also how important is the stress bit of the study? Is it... So some some studies we do, yeah. massive yield. Some studies, the referrers sort of say, whilst you're in the scanner, could you do stress? Yeah. Rather than thinking it's probably going to show something bad, mm -hmm. that sort of patient you probably wouldn't recall necessarily. You might give it a go. And if they really had no stress response, you'll have to then write to the referrer saying that they didn't have a stress. Do you want me to recall them? It's difficult because sending so a patient away is difficult. An evaluation case by case almost. But you, for yeah. for, for yeah, me, it, it is. Be, it has, it to, has be. to be because yeah, it is difficult. I mean, I've, yeah, I, I don't often, I've, I almost never do it within six, if somebody's had coffee within six hours. You know, it's yeah. very rare that I yeah. would have done it. Um, so on, on top so. of that, is this something, I know you love to teach. Yeah, uh, yeah. We work together yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. nice that yeah. you actually sit yeah. with us and you teach us. And you are one of those um, cardiologists that actually scan yeah, as well. Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah. So you yeah. like to scan. Yeah. So yeah, do you so. have any it. tips and tricks for people, radiographers that are learning how to, to do cardiac? Because it's something that, Yep. A lot of our audience yeah, yeah. likes to learn. I want to do cardiac. How do I do it? Is there anything that you would suggest to them so the, uh, for them to learn quicker? <laughs> so the, I would say that the biggest learning curve for radiographers with this is the ECG. The biggest problems come with the ECG mm. because it's not part of radiography Reading training. It. Well, many things. <laughs> so, because it leads on to, in effect, the original question, which it's is... very optimistic. How, how do you... Yeah. How, See, how, now he has this new beard that makes it even <laughs> more optimistic. <laughs> I, like, I, I like the beard. I like, I like thank the you, beard. thank I you. Like very much. I would have, Takes but my, my wife to... has said no to the beard. So, <laughs> um, so, so, for, when you, so having got the patient in, the next key bit of this is getting a good ECG trace. So if you get a bad trace at the beginning, you are... The, perhaps uh, an English terminology is peeing into the wind with what will then happen. So your preparation of the patient at the beginning is actually crucial to this. And not infrequently, if the ECG is not great, I sometimes see radio radiographers say, oh, I can't be bothered to, you know, it, it, I can see a trace. It's And then, of course, they'll be calling you in about 10 minutes yep. saying that the images look crap. So trying to get good trace is important. So you've got to think about good preparation of the chest, thinking about... You know, some some because the, the one of the challenges the lie of the heart and the chest is a bit different for everyone. I've got a beautiful case from back when I started at Kings. We could not get an ECG trace on this patient. We ended up using a pulse oximeter. Okay, yep. not as reliable, but once we <laughs> well, yeah, not not ideal, but yeah. we just literally could not. You get have nothing you, else. You can get something, not yeah. what you might. The, I mean, this case is extraordinary. I mean, I've often shown it at conferences. Basically, the reason we couldn't get a trace is the patient. Unfortunately for him, and we didn't know this until we started. So when we did the axial imaging, he'd had a pneumonectomy as, as a child. And his heart, rather than being pointing up over here, was actually on the right Whoa. side of the chest, actually the up against the back wall Jesus. of the right side of the chest. Oh I've got That's this image. It's just like, <laughs> okay, now I see why putting the ECG stickers yeah, over here wasn't work. <laughs> trace. <laughs> but... I mean, that's obviously an unusual case, but I, I mean, getting a good trace is absolutely pivotal with this. I see, I can always tell when I work with a new radiographer, I can always tell whether they've done much cardiac MR because for most scanners, they're not just doing cardiac MR. So usually you've start, you're starting a list and 
the scan they did the night before was a knee or whatever it might have been. So the ECG on the scanner isn't on. So they put the ECG on the patient, yep. but there's no actual ECG trace. You could tell the radiologists who've done a bit of this because they'll want to see the trace because they want to see how good it is. Those who don't know what they're doing won't turn the trace on. So it's your straight away your first message when you're looking. Yeah. Obviously, you're probably yeah. quite new to this. It's just because, trusting the machine blindly yeah, because they don't know more than that. Because what you then need to look at is, is the heart rhythm normal? Because all these things are going to determine what then happens in the yeah. study. What's the heart rhythm? And you don't need to get it exactly right, but... Broadly speaking, am, have I got a good trace? Is it regular? And is the sort of computer software picking up each QRS complex? Sometimes it will miss out QRS complexes. All these things are going to determine what then happens in the study. It will drive the choice of protocol as well. Yeah. To some extent, yeah, because you may change based on that. But the predominant issue from the radiographer's perspective is if you've got a rubbish trace or if the patient's got an arrhythmia, it's going to make your life more difficult. And if you just try and do the things that work for your average normal heart, you'll get a set of images yeah. that are not very good. It's not going to work. And so, of course, then you need to learn, well, what do you do about it? When it and, and these are all that as you get more advanced, you learn all these things about what to do. So. I actually want to underline mm. the importance of what you said, because mm. I think some people might say, well, actually, I believe it's more important if I learn how to plan this, how to plan that, it, which is imp important, important too. Important but too, yeah. trust me, I saw it, especially when you do like cardiac back to back, cardiac MRI, mm. let's say you have mm. 10 on day. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, even if I have a, like a, a patient that is a little bit more airy, you see the chest, you yeah. have a lot of airs, mm. you say, well, I can still crack on. I might put one here, <laughs> one here, <laughs> one here. Around. Why do I need to shave it, my girl? Yeah. Losing, maybe Maybe going with a little bit of delay, uh, going home a little bit later on time. Uh, but it, ECG is crucial. It is at the very basic of the cardiac MRI scan. So those kind of like uh, tips for patient preparation are essential. You cannot have a nice MRI scan. You can have it, but you need to be lucky at no, some point. And, and I think I could probably put a shout out here to those men like me who've got hairy chest. The other thing is if you put a sticky on hairy chest and then pull it off at the end of the study, the patient won't love you for yeah. that. Either. <laughs> They're not coming back. Shaved a bit of They're hairy not coming back. Say, yeah, get, getting a shave rather it than a wax. to me is today. The person. patient was screaming, wow, yeah, yeah. what are yeah, you yeah. doing? <laughs> so, so, you know, for me, you know, for, for me, so preparation of the chest, there's a bit of, most people use a bit of gel. There's yep, a bit yes. of gel stuff. Clean so basically, prep, yeah. yeah, exactly. Clean prep. There's a whole load of different ones. So basically shave any chest hair, clean prep on and make sure the trace is good. The, the scanners, a lot of the scanners with the newer scanners help you with this. They try and give you an idea of how good the trace is when you're actually inside the room with the patient. Yep. But if it's not good, as I say, just have in mind that you're going to, if you just think, oh, it looks all right. I know I'm only getting one bar out of five on the Siemens scanner. It'll probably be fine. It probably won't be. And particularly for a stress study, because the real problem is what you really don't want is the ECG to fail whilst you're giving the patient adenosine. Because the patient yeah. will not love you if you've got to repeat the adenosine, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's a key, it's on, if I could, it's the one thing I would say to everyone, it's the most difficult bit. You know, the planning stuff, the planning stuff is new, but it's something that radiographers are used to doing. It comes, it comes body, with practice, yeah, I would say. You know, you know how, you know, they know how to use the scanner. And so, of course, in effect, just learning the sorts of views that we like to see. The bit that's completely left field for radiographers is the ECG. It's the hardest bit. And that's why I try and... I'd offer a lot of teaching to radiographers around ECGs because it's the bit that is the most challenging bit. Awesome. So, so we have no coffee. Yeah. Uh, good for, ECG. For, for stress study. Yeah. Stress yeah. Study. If you have a, not having a stress study, then you can have as much coffee of as course, you want. Of course, yeah. So, good ECG yeah. and then good patient preparation and communication, I yeah. think, is essential there. Yeah. Can I say something about mm. this, Sam? Because actually about stress study, we yeah. spoke with Filippo in our previous episode yeah. about benefits of doing stress perfusion scans at 3T. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's yeah. the question for every yeah. cardiologist I know. Someone <laughs> says, well, yeah, because yeah. I'm a huge advocate yeah. for that. Mm. So what about you? Do you think, firstly, is there like a magnetic field strength that you would strongly recommend? Let's say that I, I think Sam asked this question to Filippo, if I recall. <laughs> if I need to yeah. buy a scanner tomorrow yeah, and yeah, I need to do If cardio. you have your own clinic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So if I was going to buy one scanner tomorrow to start a new service, without question, it would be 1.5T. Without question, it would be 1.5T. Awesome. I think it's a lot cheaper, but you might know better than me with that. So, so, so your bosses will like you for that too. But it's it's easier and the benefits of 3T that you were starting to talk about with stress aren't enough to get over some of the challenges that you face, particularly with Artifact, yeah. particularly if you're a new centre. So if you look at a lot of the centres that are doing 3T, the majority, like Amadeo, uh, Filippo's centre, they've got a whole number of magnets of which some of them are 3T and some are 1.5T. 
So if you just have, we're just going to do it on one, one scanner, scanner. For me, 1.5T any day of the week. It's much easier to scan on it. And in the end, stress perfusion is better at 3T. I mean, there's no question about that. If, if you were sort of saying to me, all you're going to do is stress perfusion, you know, um, you know, with a whole number of people who do loads of this, yeah, you'd buy a 3T scanner. But the reality is, I mean, if you look at our service, I think it's about 20% stress and 20, 80% non-stress. So, you know, their service does more stress than we do, but I, I, mean, I don't know what their numbers are, but I would be stunned if it's more than 50-50, for example. Yeah. So you're still going to do a lot of non-stress. Artifact is you know, much, 3 is much better now. The, tech, the, the secrets are much, much Absolutely. better now, but it's still not as easy as using a 1.5T scanner. So One, one of the questions that I asked, uh, yeah. Filippo as well mm. was about uh, free breathing. Yeah, yeah. What's your thoughts on free breathing for patients? I know it's more comfortable for them, of course, and with the uh, AI coming into play yeah. and new well, scanners this is the having. Without question, this is the future. I, I mean, I will be stunned in 10 years' time if we're doing much with breath hold because the technology is getting better and better with this to allow you not to do it. I mean, where we're at now with it, there's a late enhancement sequence. And you think, I mean, for us, the late enhancement is often the crux of a lot of the yeah. studies that we're doing. On Siemens solar scanners, for example, I think you just get it. You don't even think you have to, in effect, buy it separately. I think it just comes as part of the package. You have a free breathe sequence that's pretty high resolution. Many people just default to using it. Um, Cine is more difficult, um, but actually, you know, compressed sense uh, on Siemens mm -hmm. is pretty good. So, you know, your patient who can't breath hold is not really a problem anymore. I mean, that's still not ideal, but you will get a diagnostic scan in the vast majority of patients like that. And I think with the fast evolving updates that we're having with AI, this is going to be a reality oh, in completely. the next this two what I'm to saying. three years, something this like that. This is what I'm saying to you. I mean, I'll be stunned. I'll be, I mean, if we did this session again in yeah, probably five years' time, I'll be Absolutely. stunned if we're doing <laughs> a huge amount of breath hold work. Absolutely. You yeah. know. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, the way you know, things are evolving. I know a few scanners already can detect if the patient is in distress or not. Mm. So I think we're going quite fast in that direction. Absolutely. Mm. And about this, actually, mm. I was very interested when I saw that one of your massive research along with AI, that which mm. we already touched and we'll discuss a little bit in just a few moments, mm. is also about T1 and T2 maps, yeah. which is something, I believe, as a radiographer, I can yeah. tell. Sometimes I notice, um, I include myself in this category, sometimes we just perform, sometimes we don't even know why, what might be actually the <laughs> advantage, uh, you know, yeah. the rationale behind acquiring the TT or uh, T1 map on this patient. We might know, we might have, you know, the glitch of it say, yeah, we do it for this reason, but most of the time we just say, yeah, we need to acquire T2 one, T2 map, T, uh, T1 map. So can you explain that? Can you explain to the audience a little bit more how it works? Yeah, so if you want to take a slightly humorous starting point with this, Putting color on stuff, of course, is quite novel of course. in MRI <laughs> where we used to, you know, black and white gray and grayscale imaging. So straight away, actually, it appeals straight away to, to your eye to see the color. Although, of course, you're looking, thinking potentially, well, what does it all actually mean? What it's really trying to do is give you numbers. It's about quant it's about quantification. So rather than say where you might have used uh, Siemens speaker turbo spin echo sequence for T1 or you stir imaging, which is in effect, you know, grayscale, you can't tell from a T1 turbo spin echo image what's the T1 of the bit of tissue you're studying, you know, whatever it might be, a bit of muscle in the leg, whatever it might be you're looking at, heart muscle. Mapping is basically trying to allow you to put numbers on it. So you can draw a region of interest. When you do yeah. mapping, so you get this beautiful color picture, you draw a region of interest in the myocardium and say the T1 in this area is 1,050. So you've got a number. Now, what, then the question is, well, what does that number yeah, mean? That's, that, that's what I was yeah. going to ask. So what What's does the, the number range mean? Because they so, vary a lot. So one of the challenges then with this is around normal ranges, which are variable depending upon which manufacturer you use, which exactly. sequence you use. And this has been the challenge in the field. Yes. Much more. And one of the one of the nice things around T2 Star, which looks at uh, cardiac iron, mm -hmm. is it's just uniform across the scanners, so, sequences. It works really well because of that. T1 mapping you've got to have a bit of your own data around scans. What I would say around Siemens uh, T1 mapping sequences, in the end, there, were lot, there was lots of choice and they got off the fence eventually to use one that is what you will see on your own Siemens scanner. So I think you've got... Uh, we have a 1.5 Siemens and a 3 Tesla G. Yeah, but. so the, the C, they got off the fence and they've basically pitched it. So you don't get a lot of choice now. You, 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 it looks like you've got a choice of four, yeah. but they're this sort of same sequence tweaked slightly. 
across different semen scanners, the normal ranges are fairly uniform because I've done this across a whole number now. You don't see huge variation. But if you make it 3T, completely different, uh, clearly. So you need normal ranges. So, of course, then you get a number from the patient that you can compare to your normal range. Things that might increase T1 are things like scar, inflammation. So this is why it's of interest in the myocarditis field. So inflammation in the heart muscle will increase your T1. Um, infiltration with various things like amyloid protein. So these things will all increase your T1 value. And T2, T2 is, so T1 is very sensitive for lots of disease. If you're increasing T1, as that could be scar, could be, you know, T2 is much more specific to inflammatory conditions. So T2 mapping is nice for the acute stuff and myocarditis particularly. So the patient who's acutely unwell in hospital, T2 mapping is mm -hmm. very useful. Patients with autoimmune diseases yeah. where they might get myocarditis, that yeah. sort of thing, very, very useful. Would you acquire the full stack normally for myocarditis? <laughs> well, the, yeah. so, so, so now... Because it can be very time-consuming for us. A million, yeah. million dollar question. Here. Well, well, this then, because, so of course, and, and this is, I mean, this is a broad question around all MRI. There's so much you can do. I mean, there's lots of different, I mean, I know nothing about how you scan a knee, but there's no doubt I have lots of different ways to do it. Absolutely. It depends who the reporter is. They'll say, I like this, 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 and this. And you'll think, well, the other person likes it done that way. You could do it all on every patient, but you wouldn't get many scans done. So you've got to take a view of where do I draw the line with this? Because I need to have a working relationship with my radiographers. And if they keep going home late from work every day, <laughs> but, 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 you know, but, but that it is, true, I mean, this yeah, is the reality. Yeah. We'll you know, you. You know that's what I'm saying. And, and if you're doing a full cardiac dedicated this way, you're doing quite a lot of cases. So some of it for me depends on what you look, what you are looking for. Mm -hmm. There are some patients where it is completely unhelpful to do a lot, a lot of mapping because what you're looking, what you think you're looking at, is a very diffuse disease process, and therefore, you know, doing eight cuts through the left ventricle is like, well, you you should see it on one because the process you're looking for. So, for example, amyloidosis is a good example of this. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's a very diffuse disease, and although I might have a bit of focal stuff, I mean, doing eight slices through the ventricle might be a vague interest in the academic world, but in clinical, it's well overkill. My own practice typically is my default position is to do five images. So I do a fourth chamber, three chamber and two chamber long axis and a basal and mid short axis. That's mm -hmm. my default position with yeah. it. The reason for that is the same as late GAD. If you see an abnormality in both long axis and short axis, it's probably real. That you. So it's about trying to build in a degree of redundancy, well, not redundancy, it's trying to build in a degree of reproducibility yeah. and a degree of, particularly for subtle stuff, if you only see it in one view and not the other, it might still be real because you don't know which one's right, but you're going to be a little bit more sitting on the fence mm. around it. If you see it in two views, and of course for inflammatory conditions, most often what you'll see is the T1 and T2 will be mm. elevated. So in effect, you've got four chances with it. So you've got long axis, short axis, T1 and T2. If they're all abnormal, the report is going to be going very to be bold. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is clearly your life, no debate. I could show this to 100 cardiologists. Yeah. They're all going to tell you the same thing. <laughs> if one of those four images is abnormal, then you've got to be a little bit more careful. And you're thinking, well, okay, am I sure about this? And you may have to write a report that's a bit more of a fence set. So that's how I like to do it. Rather than just doing lots of short axis. That axes, is very clear. Absolutely. The long axis I find helpful Absolutely with it. Absolutely clear. So it's just um, yeah. about the T1 and T2 yeah. uh, they were just talking about. My question is, do you believe there's some bias, manufactured bias when you do research, if you're using different manufacturers for do that research? Let's say you're doing research on a cardiac pathology with the Zeeman yeah. scanner and yeah. you use T1 and T2 mapping there. Yeah. And you say the values might the range of values might change according to the manufacturer that you're yeah, using. Very much and so, then you yeah. sit down on a GE scanner, you do the same cohort of patients looking right. for the same kind of pathology. Is there some manufacturer bias there that you have to actually state on the paper or you don't mention that? One of the challenges would be if you want to do a large multi-center trial, if you did it with multiple different magnets with multiple different sequences, actually trying to do something with the data will then, of course, be more complicated. So we're desperate when we do stuff to try and not do this because you think, so for example, let's say, let's say you've got amyloidosis and on a semen scanner, your T1 is 
1,150, but there's a completely different normal range on GE and the, the normal range goes up to 800 and on this, mm. so therefore it's not. But if you plonk, plonk all those numbers in together and do an average, it becomes almost meaningless. So the statistics around it become very difficult. The, the, I mean, all I would say to you, I think probably what you get, the, the key thing is having normal ranges. You, you have to have different normal ranges for the for these groups. The manufacturers will probably make some argument that some sequences are better than others. That probably is true to some extent. That as always in MRI, there's, you know, swings and roundabouts. So, I mean, even amongst Siemens, there was lots of debate about which sequence should be used as the main one in the end. You know, at the end of the day, most of them have gone down the same path now. I actually don't know what GE ended up doing because I don't work with a GE scanner. But I think that they went, in the end, I think they went down the same path with the same mm -hmm. sort of sequence yep. technology. Very interesting, so, extremely interesting. And also before, you mentioned that you have quite a lot of expectations about the future of cardiac MRI, especially mm. combined uh, with artificial intelligence. Yep. So, well, they always said that the future might be now. So what, <laughs> what, what do you think is the current, let's call it, status I mean, of art of like artificial intelligence in cardiac MRI? What are the benefits, implications, and also challenges? Um, well, it may put me out of a job. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I think, so broad, broadly speaking, there's two sides to this, isn't there? There's one, what it might do to the person writing the report, and the other is what it might do for the person doing the scan. What I would like to see, and there's loads of PhD and interest in this from the radiographer's perspective, is what you want in the background. Having a cardiologist supervise isn't easy for a whole number of reasons, right? So when, when we first met, it was odd for you having a having a clinician in the yeah, room, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is what happens. You know, the clinician here is a bit of an odd feeling. <laughs> so that pressure this, as well. This, isn't yes, it? My, this is my domain. I don't, you know, I don't don't normally have a radiologist in here when I'm doing the knee type thing. You know, I would tell the radiologist what to do, and this is a slightly odd setup. It's also for us. I mean, I love it, but for most cardiologists, they don't love being part of it. Yes. Where the benefit comes is if there's a problem along the way. It's a bit like what you were talking about with the ECG. But sometimes you go into a scan thinking you're going to find something and actually what you end up seeing is completely left field and you therefore want to change things. And that may be difficult for the radiographer. If the radiographer is quite senior and seen lots, they'll work it out. If it's someone quite junior, much more difficult. So what I suspect you may find with the AI is it starts giving you an idea. So, for example, if you have on the scanner it telling you the right heart's a bit big. Now, that might be hard to spot at the time of the scan, but of course, if you knew that, you might run a whole load of things thinking, well, why is it quite big? I'm going to do some flow imaging with this or that, whatever. There you go, yeah. The AI, I think, is going to help with this. It may also, I mean, you already see it on Siemens, help you planning. Yeah. Some of the mm -hmm. planning stuff, that will get better. You have the yeah. dot you know, system. That's on what I'm saying. So those things will system, all continue yeah. to improve. Because if you can teach the three of us to do it, you can teach a computer to do it. Of course. Right? <laughs> we have mentioned so. this, apologies, mm. but yeah. we have mentioned this, there is a new vendor which is called um, United, United Imaging. Imaging. Yeah, they're doing basically the auto line, almost mm. kind of like... It does it all by yeah, itself, Yeah, it right? does everything by itself, almost. So, so yeah, so we're definitely saying, reaching so, that. So from the radiographer's perspective, it's going to change a lot with this. From the reporter's perspective, there are many steps in the reporting process that are bloody arduous and it will help you straight away with that I, I mean going forward in the future of course if you're reporting in a particular hospital it might even help you looking at patient no there's just a whole number of steps that take quite a lot of time when i was doing my research a lot of it's drawing circles to try and get <laughs> left ventricular sizes yes. And uh, you laugh, but, you know, I ended up with repetitive strain oh, injury. Just really? because, well, because you wow. end up, but, I mean. Because you're doing each one of them manually and you have to do more three or four in the same picture sometimes on the same scan. When you start putting your mind, thinking about your list of 10, you know, sort of thing, it's it's not a minor thing. Now, of course, the technology is already much better than that. I often laugh with the fellows saying, you know, this used to be much more complicated. <laughs> But it will continue to improve. I still draw too many circles. There should be no need for me to do that. Mm -hmm. So I still draw too many circles with this. I think in the end, it's also going to help alert you to pathology. So some some of the challenges cardiologists reporting is the extra cardiac anatomy. Mm -hmm. um, so we maybe in one or two percent of scans find bad things, actually, you know, lung cancers, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, you know, our training for this sort of thing is much less than a uh, uh, radiologists training so I think it will help you with that sort of thing as well it's coming 
I mean, it's all I coming. think it's here already. Yes, I think it's, 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 already it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a matter of adapting to it as quick completely. as possible. Yeah, completely. I think AI is replacing most the cognitive skills, yeah. Yeah. not as much as yeah. the motor skills, because nobody's going to position the patient for us. Yeah. But the reporting side of it, or yeah. the, the anatomy planning, that's the easiest part AI will that's take over for sure. That's the the lower yeah. hanging fruit. <clears throat> One of the concerns is liability. What do you think about it? Someone say, <laughs> are we going to blame a computer for like potential wrong diagnosis well, that someone else has provided? I mean, and you see, I mean, in, in, in the UK at the moment, you see there's this big scandal over the post office where all these terrible things happen because some computer software got something wrong, yeah. you know, and it Absolutely. ruined people's lives. So, yeah, this that, is a big exactly problem. That's exactly what Julian is mentioning, that we want to avoid that kind of, of situation. But so, so you can sort of envisage that the role of the reporter is going to be, there will still be a role for the reporter for the for, long for the foreseeable future, looking over all of this. But one of the challenges, I think, because a lot of the reports I do, um, some of them I do the whole thing myself, some of them one of my juniors has done a pre-report. Even though you know that, they're not at consultant level, they stay straight away still biases you a little bit in how you're thinking and the AI report's going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, and, and often that will be because it's right. Uh, but occasionally if it's got it wrong, you may go into it in the wrong mindset when the words are already on a page in front of you rather than if you were just doing it from the outset. At the end of the day, if something is wrong on that report, are you answer for it, or is it the manufacturer of the AI system that provided this, that report? This, this will be the challenge. I think that's yeah, the, the that, main this challenge, is right? The that's what you were asking. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the main the, problem. I, I mean, I suspect for the long foreseeable, foreseeable future, that's going to responsibility is going to fall on the clinician. Yeah, I which think. isn't fair. <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of, I would say, if, because what, if you're using that tool yeah. to aid you do a better job and then because of the tool and you know it's because of the tool let's put mm. it that way mm. and there was an error there you miss it or you miss something because that tool was biased in the data they they learned from yeah at the end of the day it's going to fall on you and it's kind of unfair situation but it's something it, that we have to adapt in as quick as possible I yeah would say. I, mean, I mean i think i think that's right and it, it probably as i say in the short term it won't be a pro i can see problems with this in 10 years time where you become potentially heavily reliant on it. At the moment, someone like me isn't used to that, and therefore probably would be much more interested. I, I can imagine in 10 years time, where everyone says, oh, it's great, this software, it never gets it wrong, you know, <laughs> but you then become more blasé at that point, you've yeah. become more trusting of it. At this yeah. stage, we're all be going into it thinking, I'm sure it's very good, but <laughs> I'd like to have a look myself before trust. So I, I suspect down the line that will be an issue. And that's going to have to be debated amongst the medical profession. Absolutely. Because it's not just going to be radiology where this is an issue. It's going to be a whole number of things outside too where there'll be similar problems. Perfect. I think we will have a lot to talk maybe in another session. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're reaching almost the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, We yeah. have one more question, I think, is our final mm. questions that Please, we do yeah. for all our guests. Um, mm. And we want to understand why MRI for you? Um. I mean, I think I said to you at the beginning, I love imaging the heart and I love what I loved about ultrasound originally. And it's the same for me with MRI is you get all this information and the biggest risk to the patient is getting to the hospital. Yeah, they're more likely to be involved in a road traffic accident being blunt, getting to you than having a problem with most of what you're going to do to them. So you're getting all this information in an extremely safe manner. What I love about MRI over ultrasound is that ultrasound is... Yeah, some patients have beautiful ultrasound images. It's the same with ultrasound in your tummy. Some people, um, MRI, it's unusual to get a terrible set of images. You know, if you do a, scatter, a list of 10, nine of them will be a good set. So you're just seeing beautiful images of what is very often interesting things because we don't do a huge amount of normal scans. So you're seeing a lot of interesting cardiology and that then makes you feel like you're making a difference to the patient who in, yeah. the, in the end is the person who is going to benefit from this. So. Absolutely. Julian, do you want to add anything else? No, actually, I wanted to talk a little bit more AI in cardiac yeah. arrival. <laughs> we'll do another session. I think yeah. we will definitely need another <laughs> session. Yeah, we'll I would like, like to come back. Absolutely. We would like I to ask you one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, we always give this to our guests to oh, just give you. a small signature and small comment to us. Um, so if you don't mind. I'm delighted. Yeah, <laughs> no problem and we yeah, really yeah. appreciate the fact that you were yeah. here with yeah, us today. Absolutely. So it's a pleasure. I mean, for me, education, a chance to educate and chat about MRI, 
always happy. Wonderful. Uh, always nice. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Dan. You're very thank kind. You. Thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. You.